very good morning everyone and before start i want to say thank you very much after, to the organizers for this opportunity it's an honor for me to be here and well hope you enjoy the presentation then um i'm going to talk about this but before start i would like to mention a little bit about the kidney function just to remember what kidney is that you can see there that one of the functions is hemostasis, which is the important part of the kidney just to maintain the balance in the body for the fluids and electrolytes. And we can see there that a part of that have an impact in the acid base and the blood pressure control, and we will talk about that in a minute. And some expression of removal of metabolic waste and some drugs, for example, and the endocrine function is the erythropoietin that probably you hear about that in patients when they have a chronic kidney disease, they need exogenous erythropoietin PN injections because the kidneys are not working and can secrete that hormone, which is important for the anemia management. Renin for the blood pressure and vitamin D, which is important to maintain the calcium phosphate metabolism. And how we measure the kidney function, there are a few or gold standard ways to measure the kidney function, and you can see there, one is the inulin clearance, actually doesn't really, we don't really use that, but it's the best way to measure the inulin clearance, and this is inulin is coming from the plants, especially some plants like garlic, onions, and they need to be cannula and need to be administered to the patients, and it's a really good way, and needs to measure every hour or every two hours in urine, but actually it's not something that we do in a practice. And the other one, a nuclear scan measuring radioactive dressed excretion, which yes, we do pre-transplant or post-transplant patients, but this is an expensive and it uh, needs to a cannula in it means to administer that radioactive tracer, so it's not really practical in the clinical practice. What we use, definitely what we use to measure the kidney function is a creatinine. Urea, sometimes that helps, but can be uh, affected for some conditions, hemodynamic conditions like dehydration, for example, or hypermetabolic situations. Cystatin C, years ago they used that, but they are not using that anymore because can be affected for different situations like age, height, smoking, steroid therapies. What we use, with, we use is creatinine. Creatinine, and I remember years, years ago, I used to do the calculation. You can see that in the bottom to check the calculation of the creatinine in urine and in blood, or in blood is the formula that crack of gold, but that we don't use anymore because actually the laboratory give you the glomerular filtration rate of the patients, much easier now. The creatinine is a breakdown product from the muscle, and yes, can be affected for age, or gender, race, diet, muscle mass, or some medications, but actually it's the best way to measure how the kidneys are function, and that will can uh, stratify what kind of kidney disease the patient is having at the moment, and the progression of the kidney disease. We will talk about that in a minute as well. But this is what we use to measure the glomerular filtration rate. So, Glomerular filtration rate should be more than 90 mils per minute in a person of 1.73 meters square. Values under 60, that means that the patients have kidney disease, which we don't know if it's acute or chronic, but the patients have acute uh, green kidney disease. So this is very important, you know, and we need to just be careful because if we have a creatinine that is normal, but we measure the glomerular filtration rate that we were talking about, the volume and weight and, and age of the patients, some patients, for example, elderly patients with a creatinine of 100 maybe has kidney disease because if you measure the glomerular filtration rate, it's going to be lower than 60 because of the muscle, Yes, and the muscle of the patients and elderly patients is lower than in adults, yes, and that can affect the measure of the glomerular filtration rate. So what is chronic kidney disease then? Chronic kidney disease, as I said before, yes, we know, is when the glomerular filtration rate is under 60, 
But there are other situations that we are talking about uh, that kidney damage, like albuminuria, hematuria, when we exclude urine infection or any urological causes, or another pathology and normalities. So it's not only when the patients have low glomerular filtration rate. However, how we can differentiate acute or chronic is because of the time. If the patients have more than three months of glomerular filtration rate until 60, or microalbuminuria or proteinuria, we are talking about chronic kidney disease. But we need to have a blood test done before. So if a patient comes to the clinic and we have that value now, we can't say if it's acute or chronic. Maybe we can think about the comorbidities that is a chronic, but we can just make sure that this patient is a chronic or acute. And this happens quite often in hospital when the patients come to emergency and require dialysis. We don't know if we are putting dialysis a patient with acute or chronic kidney disease. We need to have a blood test before just to make sure that the patient is acute or chronic. So more than three months of glo uh, low glomerular filtration rate, we are talking about chronic disease. But CKD is a major public health problem. It's very common. We know that one in 10 Australian adults have CKD. Look at the number. But the problem is like 90% of them, they don't know that they have kidney diseases like diabetes, hypertension. They, when they become symptomatic, when they have symptoms of the kidney disease, probably is when actually the kidneys are working 10% or, or lower than 60%, when they're working only small percentage. So most 90% of the patients, you can see, 90% of the patients, you know, they don't know that they have kidney disease. And they come up with kidney disease when they have symptoms. And it's harmful because when they have symptoms, it's probably too late. And the other thing that is a independent risk factor of cardiovascular disease, and we will talk a little bit about that in a minute. So it's treatable. If we treat the comorbidities, if we treat the risk of cardiovascular risk, this we can reduce the progression of the kidney disease. There are many things we can do and we to reduce the progression and have less patients with CKD. You can see here in Australia, and that is information taken from ANSATA, that is a registry that where we collect all the patients, all the information for patients in Australia and New Zealand with chronic uh, with kidney disease. And we have many patients with hypertension, diabetes, but we have a high number of patients with CKD, stage one, two, three, that maybe they don't know that they have chronic kidney disease. And when they become symptomatic is when they have stage four or five and probably miss the opportunity to reduce the, the, reduce the progression because is when, when they have stage four or five, is when they become symptomatic. And actually the number of patients that start dialysis is not big if we compare with the big population with chronic kidney disease. So the causes of chronic kidney disease, you can see number one, diabetes. In Australia, diabetes is 34% of causes of chronic kidney disease. But we have another ones like glomerulonephritis, and you have there AGA, nephropathy, nephrotic syndrome, osphasculitis, hypertension, polycystic kidney disease, cancer, obstruction, reflux, for example, chronic infections. Analgesics, there are more causes of chronic kidney disease, but diabetes is definitely, we know that the number one cause of chronic kidney disease. How the chronic kidney disease is presented? Sometimes it's asymptomatic, yes, and we just check a blood test and found that the creatinine is high, and we do the glomerular filtration rate, and we found that it's under 60. Or can have, the patients can have hematuria or proteinuria. Be careful, sometimes we have hematuria, it's maybe because the patient have a urinary infection. That means that they have a chronic kidney disease. But sometimes hematuria or proteinuria is a, a, another way to present the patient, the presentation of the patients with chronic kidney disease. Hypertension, edema or fluid retention. And then the symptoms secondary to the primary disease, like vasculitis with a rash, depend of the vasculitis or of the primary kidneys, primary disease. 
and symptoms of uremia. Uremia is something that happens, but usually happens when the patients are under 15 or under 20 of GFR, especially under 10, they really have symptoms of uremia, nausea, vomiting, itchiness, restless legs, insomnia, feeling cold. Um, it is very common and a symptom of uremia. And then some other complications of chronic kidney disease like bone disease, anemia, electrolytes disbalance, hyperpotassemia, metabolic acidosis. So this is the connection with CKD and diabetes. We know that every second patient you see with diabetes type 2 will have CKD. So remember that when we are talking about CKD and diabetes, we can say the patients with diabetes has chronic kidney disease if they present with microalbuminuria or proteinuria and with a effective glomerular filtration rate under 60, that we say that before, or hematuria and exclude another causes of urinary infection or urologic problems. So a glomerular filtration rate under 60, less than one in two, 20 patients with diabetes and chronic kidney seals will live long enough to require, require dialysis and transplantation. And why that happen? Because usually patients with chronic kidney disease and diabetes, they must die for another complications like cardiovascular complications, myocardial infarction, strokes, different cardiovascular complications or heart failure, risk of infections that require hospitalizations, metabolic alterations, fractures and falls. So complications of the diabetes neuropathy or another complications not by the kidney, chronic kidney disease itself. So you see that only less than one in 20 patients with diabetes and CKD will live long enough to require dialysis transplantation. What happens when the patients have end-stage kidney disease or what we call it chronic kidney disease stage 5? There are some modalities that we offer to the patients like transplant, that is the ideal, but it's not for everyone. And we have hemodialysis, we have peritoneal dialysis with two different modalities of peritoneal dialysis. And I just add here, it's important that some patients, especially over 75 years of age with multiple comorbidities, and conservative management is something that we are, need to offer the patients and another option of a treatment, active treatment of chronic kidney disease. And this is a little bit of what I work as well, just with patients for conservative management. And I can tell you, patients that age, elderly patients with chronic or end-stage kidney disease, they live much longer than what we think. If we treat the fluid status of the patients, the electrolytes imbalance, the anemia, they live years with only kidney working less than 10%. I have many patients in that situation, so that is an active treatment, and, and that works well for patient, elderly patients, and they have better quality of life than having dialysis. But for the rest of the population, definitely dialysis, peritoneal dialysis, and then transplant are the best treatment options to treat end-stage kidney disease. So chronic kidney disease and diabetes, what the connection? Well, we know well that the cardiovascular um, disease outcomes are, in, are increased in patients that have chronic kidney disease and diabetes. Dialysis survival definitely is lower in patients with diabetes for all the complications by diabetes itself. And the post-transplant survival definitely is not that good when the patients are, have diabetes that they one day don't have diabetes. You can see here the progression of the, the new patients in starting dialysis that have diabetes. If we have type 1 diabetes, actually it's quite stable, the number of patients that start dialysis. But look at what's happened with diabetes type 2. The increased number of patients with diabetes type 2 starting dialysis is increasing and will continue increasing. That is a little bit of many factors. We know the survival or life expectancy is increasing. We have more patients with comorbidities and diabetes, chronic kidney disease, cardiovascular complication, all affect kidneys, and we have more patients starting dialysis. And you know the majority of 
patients starting dialysis are over 70, 75 years of age. That is the big population that start dialysis. And that is because of all the comorbidities and diabetes. And that's the reason why we have so many patients with type 2 diabetes starting dialysis. And will continue increasing. Yes. And the last uh, ANS data that was, uh, which is the register where we have all the information actually, been increasing that population, but with the conservative management is more steady over the last couple of years and actually reduced a little bit of the patients starting dialysis over 75 years of age because of the conservative management option for that population. A little bit about what happened with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island patients. We all know that the patients have five times more likely to have chronic kidney disease or end-stage kidney disease, and actually are younger than the general populations. And around 45 or 54 years of age, the patients quite often die with chronic kidney disease or end-stage kidney disease. And why that happened? Many factors and social factor, cultural factor, economic factors, you know, and we have this group of patients with multiple comorbidities, with diabetes, more risk of repeated infections, high blood pressure, obesity. Unfortunately, all are factors that patients who have original patients or Torres Strait Island patients, they have as a risk to develop chronic kidney disease. So we need to think about chronic kidney disease is not just only kidneys. We need to see the human being, the big picture, and not focus only the kidneys. And we know that it's a big association, chronic kidney disease, with other comorbidities like diabetes, hypertension, cardiovascular disease, and, and obesity. And, and this is very clear, and we need to treat all of those comorbidities if we want to reduce the progression of the kidney disease. Let's talk about this case, Peter. Peter is, uh, and with that clinic case, you can see a bit more about what we do to treat patients with kidney disease. Peter is a 62 years old man, Caucasian man, work full time, businessman. He just came to the clinic because the wife is having a flu injection and just wanted to do a checkup. But he was feeling okay, he was feeling well, just a little bit of cough and yellow sputum. But he was a smoker. He was been smoking for many years, 40 years, and one packet per day, alcohol, seven, ten drinks per week, one cup a day. That's not that bad. But been drinking nutrition, diabetic diet. Something that looks like he hasn't been seeing much the GP, so we don't know exactly what kind of diabetes, diabetic diet. Some medical condition, well, he is definitely he has diabetes type 2 that was diagnosed one year ago after he was feeling third, but he said, I'm all right now. All right. And he said that he takes some medications and anti inflammatories for back pain, but occasionally. We check the blood pressure, the blood pressure 160 over 90, with the weight 102 and BMI 31. And weight circumference 110, and chest funding that white, okay. So he didn't have a COPD or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, just some, uh, it's not just some bronchitis and nothing else. Quite common in patients, smokers. So is better at increased risk of kidney disease? What do you think? Yeah, exactly. And so why? Well, we have risk factors for kidney disease, and this is the more important part of this presentation. Well, just to mention the risk factor, because if we treat the risk factor, we can reduce the progression of the kidney disease. And this is the focus of care of this group of patients. Diabetes, we know that is a risk factor. Hypertension, cardiovascular disease, family history of kidney failure, obesity, smoker, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island, history of acute kidney disease, age over 60. We have few that Peter has. Peter has five of the major risk factor of CKD. And we know that one in three Australian adults nowadays are at increased risk of CKD because of the risk factor. We have high number of patients with this. 
uh, these risk, uh, risk factors. We know Peter has diabetes, hypertension, obesity. We have a BMI, we say 31, 32. It's over 30, smoker. And he is 62 years of age. So it's another risk factor. What does Peter diabetes mean for the CKD? We know that 20 to 40 patients with type 2 diabetes develop nephropathy, diabetic nephropathy, and that we have two stages. We have the first part where the patients have early nephropathy, just proteinuria, microalbuminuria, and we'll talk about that soon, and with normal glomerular filtration rate. But we have the second stage that the patients have more albumin in urine, albumin, I mean proteinuria albumin, because albumin is the more important protein in the blood that is filtrated through the urine and is the cause of albuminuria, should be low, less than 30, but very small amount of albumin should be in the urine in normal kidney function, but this is the second part. Microalbuminuria is important because it's cause of kidney disease and macroalbuminuria definitely with progressive decline of the glomerular filtration rate. However, there is a small percentage, well, small, 33%. There is evidence of 33% of individuals with diabetes with low glomerular filtration rate that present with no proteinuria. Albuminuria, this is important because there is enough evidence that is cause of cardiovascular disease. This is a marker of cardiovascular disease. If the patients have albuminuria, the risk of cardiovascular disease is high. And this is one of the things that we focus in renal to treat albuminuria. Very, very important. In diabetes population, what happened? We have normal glomerular filtration rate, just some albuminuria, and then we found, if we follow up the patients, we found that glomerular filtration rate is getting better and increase. And that means that the patient is getting, the kidney function is improving, it's not. Actually, we have to be careful because if we have better glomerular filtration rates than before because of the hyperfiltration and the albuminuria is increasing, the amount of albumin in the urine is increasing, that is a risk. We know that it's a matter of time that the patient will develop advanced chronic kidney disease and irreversible. This is the part that we need to really focus in the treatment to treat the albuminuria and reduce the risk factor of chronic kidney disease because when we have good glomerular filtration rate is the time. When the glomerular filtration rate starts deteriorating, it's a little bit light and we need to treat that before. And then it's when the glomerular filtration rate is deteriorating is when the albuminuria increase. And then we have the nephrotic syndromes of some patients. It's a lot of protein in the urine and the patients become fluid overload for the complication of low albumin in blood and all the complication of cardiovascular complication of this condition. Well, how we measure albumin? We have something that we call it albumin creatinine radio. In normal values, it uh, should be less than 3.5. You can see there, normal, less than 3.5 in females and 2.5 in males, but we have microalbuminuria in if in females is 3.5 to 35, or in males 2.5 to 25. And you see there that we need to measure every three months, so repeat the samples if the patients have a microalbuminuria, and if they have a macroalbuminuria or proteinuria, is if it's more than 3.5, 35, sorry, and males more than 25. And that is very important that we can differentiate if it's microalbuminuria or macroalbuminuria for the treatment is different and in those conditions. And that means that the kidney function is really deteriorating if we are at the stage of having the patients with macroalbuminuria. So what is the relationship with hypertension and chronic kidney disease? We know well that hypertension is common in patients with diabetes and that Hypertension is five to eight times likely to have a albuminuria. 
and the blood pressure control is a more effective way to reduce the progression of chronic kidney disease. So we need to focus in chronic kidney disease. So obesity. And obesity, definitely, there is a relationship with chronic kidney disease. We know that uh, with a BMI of over 30, patients have 40 to 80 percent more likely to develop chronic kidney disease. And the association of obesity with albuminuria and proteinuria is increased. And that is a little bit related also to the control of the blood pressure in patients with obesity, which is more difficult. Smoking the same, that can be related to chronic kidney disease and probably the because of the cardiovascular comorbidities associated to smoking. Do you think that the anti-inflammatories that Peter was taking was uh, related to chronic kidney disease? Probably no. He was taking that occasionally, no, and for not all the time, so that is not really related. But it's important that the use of diuretics, anti-inflammatories, and, and IC inhibitors, they are the ones that we use to treat for blood pressure, are not given to the patients with chronic kidney disease together because of the effect of acute deterioration on the chronic kidney disease, which is called a triple whammy. So make sure that the patients with chronic kidney disease, they don't have that association on medication. Chest infection, not really. It's not really an infection that the patient becomes septic to affect the kidney disease. So there is no relationship of that. Kidney damage, we have to measure urine stick, urine albumin, radio, 24-hour urine protein, serum creatinine, glomerular filtration rate, ultrasound, we can do that. By the way, we know that the kidney health check from Kidney Health Australia, they suggest blood tests, glomerular filtration rate, urine tests, albuminary, creatinine, radio, and the blood pressure control is very important to treat patients and prevent progression of the kidney disease. So we can do the acute albumin creatinine radio, we can do the serum creatinine and effect, uh, the effective glomerular filtration rate. That is what we need to monitor the patients like Peter with chronic kidney disease. Peter has a blood pressure quite high, sodium high, sodium normal, chloride alright, potassium okay, bicarbonate is okay, white blood cell, red blood cell, so it's not anemic. The creatinine is a little bit high and has a glomerular filtration rate of 36. So they have some macroalbuminuria, the HbA1c is high, lipid triglycerides are high. So we can say that I don't know if you've seen that. This is from Kidney Health Australia, and they are, you can assess when the patient, which stage of the chronic kidney disease the patients are, and you can have an app in your phone, which where you add the glomerular filtration rate, the creatinine, and they will tell you what the stage of the kidney disease the patient is on. This patient's Peter is 3B. You can see there that they have a microalbuminuria and a glomerular filtration rate 46, actually. This is 30 to 44, so it's, we can consider 3B. So we need to check definitely, yes, the uh, albumin creatinine radio every three months, and patients with diabetes hypertension, and, and for patients in frequency in general, it's one to two years if the patients have risk of um, fact risk factors of developed chronic kidney disease. We don't really talk much about um, imaging ultrasound. We know that patients with chronic kidney disease secondary to diabetes nephropathy, the kidney size is a little bit bigger than the normal size, and patients that they are not diabetes, the kidneys are small. But it's important to rule out uh, polykystin disease or uropathies, obstructive uropathy, that is another cause of chronic kidney disease. So changes in lifestyle modifications, hypertension treat with medication for that, diabetes, refer to endocrinologists, cardiovascular risk are very important for the treatment. I'm going to mention very quick, there are uh, the app that I mentioned before, you can have all the goals of management of patients with chronic kidney disease and really recommend to, it's free and you can download in your phone. They can tell you how to measure and what to measure in this group of patients to achieve or reduce the progression of kidney disease. 
And medication to treat the blood pressure is important as inhibitors or ARBs are very important to reduce the progression of the kidney disease. So the blood pressure target that we achieve for these patients we need to achieve is 130 over 80. And this is, should be less than that. That is the maximum with blood pressure medications. And the blood pressure medication that we use also reduce the microalbuminuria or albuminuria, which that effect is important for these patients. Diabetes, I'm going to leave for a little bit this for diabetes, but definitely we need to treat the diabetes for for these patients to reduce the progression of kidney disease. Metformin only if the patients have thir less than 30 is not recommended. And there are new therapies that is not the point of this presentation, but there are new therapies that they are working well for treatment of the colonic kidney disease. And this is what um, they are talking about now in uh, about the treatment for chronic kidney disease and diabetes. So we know that the picture we have to check lipids because most of the patients over 50 years of age, they need to be on statins. We need to check HbA1c, diabetes assessment consultation, and don't forget eyes and food care that are important for diabetes. And to finish, we need to think not about kidneys. We know that all the factors around kidneys are the ones that uh, we need to treat more than kidneys but itself. So if we are able to reduce the risk factors to develop or progression of kidney disease, we can help this patient like Peter to reduce the risk or the chances to go to dialysis. And target the blood pressure, glycemic control, lipids, lifestyle factors, modification with smoking, for example. And remember that nurses are is a good way for the patients to reduce the progression because are the ones that they can spend more time with the patients talking about educations and the management of this group of patients. And definitely, if we are able to provide that education and reduce the risk factors, we will have less patients with chronic kidney disease and less patients on dialysis. But this is the point, reduce the risk factors of these patients and treat the blood pressure with medications. Thank you.